Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Art History from Beatastic. Today we're going to be talking about two very interesting aspects of Russian history. The first of these was the Petrushevsky Circle, which met in, starting in the middle of the 1800s and contained mostly writers and poets, but also had some other uh, diverse people in it. The second of these groups was the Belyayev Circle, which was a meeting of mostly composers and musicians that started meeting in, towards the end of the 19th century. All right, so let's talk about the Petrushevsky Circle. This was founded by Mikhail Petrushevsky, who in the early 1840s had attended Viktor Poroshin's lectures on socialist ideas at the University of St. Petersburg. Now, Petrushevsky was particularly impressed by the ideas of Charles Fourier, who was a French utopian socialist. Now, it's important to note that Fourier's beliefs might have been socialist, but they're not the same as Karl Marx's socialism. So Fourier believed in tolerance, religious tolerance, social tolerance, and also believed in a society which was perfect with no property and everyone sharing equal resources. Petrushevsky really liked Fourier and he wanted to share his ideas. So he invited friends to visit him for the purpose of discussing these ideas. By 1845, this group had grown a lot and Petrushevsky became a well-known figure. At this point, the circle had grown so big that in the fall of 1845, Petrushevsky made these meetings weekly. They would meet on Fridays and it became a sort of popular event for intellectuals. Theodor Dostoevsky is a very famous Russian writer that we all know. He wrote Crime and Punishment and a lot of other famous books. And he mostly discusses human nature, psychology, existentialism, and a lot of philosophical ideas. Now Dostoevsky started attending Petrushevsky's Friday meetings in 1847. At the time, he thought that these meetings were just ordinary social occasions with nothing particularly radical about them. But he soon saw that there was a wide diversity of points of views. Even atheistic socialists were in the meeting. There were deeply religious poets and there were literary artists, but all of them held in common this desire for more freedom in Russia. They wanted freedom in social life and intellectual life, literary life and artistic life. They also were worried about the enslaved status of the Russian peasantry. It's important to note that the Russian peasants were basically slaves up until 1861. Although Tsar Nicholas I, the current ruler, had made it clear that he opposed the enslavement, there was a lot of issues among the higher class people and they wanted to keep their positions over the serfs. So for this reason, the serfs were still slaves basically. Now. Following the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, it became apparent that the kinds of social transformation were going to be aggressively stifled by the ruling classes in Russia. So, quick refresher for European history. In 1848, a bunch of revolutions occurred across Europe. It started in France, there was a revolution that made a new republic, and other countries were soon inspired by this, and revolutions occurred in Austria, in Hungary, and many other countries. Although most of these countries eventually restored the ruling class, and not much change happened, the ideas that from the revolutions were still present. This included Russia, where all the wealthy people, the ruling class and the Tsar, etc., started to crack down even more on radical ideas. Membership of the circle increased, but discussions became more formal, serious, and less radical. Petrushevsky, who had always tended to sort of boast about his radical ideas, had for some time been a person of interest to the secret police, but they now decided to place him under close surveillance, so the meetings became much less radical. The government's concerns were not without foundation, however. One prominent aristocrat, Nikolai Spesnev, had begun attending the Friday meetings in early 1848, and he was resolutely in favor of promoting the socialist cause. Spesnev was so interested in promoting socialism that he even wanted to use terrorism to promote this and he also formed his own secret society within the circle. So, he and Petrushevsky held meetings with a charismatic Siberian figure to discuss the possibility of coordinated armed revolts. At this point, the government realized that there was a serious conspiracy going on in this group, so they cracked down on them. At some point, many members of the group were arrested, including Dostoevsky. The members of the circle who were arrested were brought to Semyonov place for execution. This included Dostoevsky. As they stood in the square waiting to be shot, a messenger came to the proceedings with a notice of reprieve. As part of a pre-planned intentional deception, the Tsar had prepared a letter to commute the death sentences. Some of the prisoners were eventually sent to Siberia and others to prisons. Dostoevsky had his eight-year sentence reduced to four years. 
The growth of the circle led to the formation of a number of satellite groups, most notably the Palm Durov Circle, which met at one of the apartments of Alexander Palm and Sergei Durov, which were two very famous writers in Russia as well. According to Dostoevsky, the original purpose of this group had been to publish a literary almanac. Now, during the Enlightenment, a similar almanac had been published mostly by French writers, and now this is happening in Russia later on. Two other famous writers were also members of the Petrushevsky Circle, Valerian Maikov and Vissarion Belinsky. One of the group's most famous moments was when Dostoevsky read out loud the letter to Gogol, which was written by Belinsky. Now, Gogol was this writer who was very loyal to the autocracy and to the Orthodox Church. The letter claimed, for example, that the church has always served as the prop of the knout and the servant of despotism. Again, after Dostoevsky read this letter out loud, it produced a very loud response from the group of approval and excitement. Shortly after Berlinsky's letter was read out loud, arrests began. A large group of arrests were made on April 22nd, 1849, and the members of the circle were first detained at the Peter and Paul Fortress. All those associated with the letter were treated very harshly, and many people who were even innocent in the group were also arrested. Among these was the poet Pleshayev, who, according to the verdict, for distributing Belinsky's letter, was deprived of all rights of the state and sent to hard labor in factories for four years. However, some members escaped prosecution, but a lot of them were indeed arrested and put on trial. The trial was to take place according to military law rather than the far more lenient civil law, so again, these punishments were very strict for these people. Of the 60 men originally arrested, 15 were sentenced to execution and the others to hard labor or exile. Reviewing this decision, the highest military court ruled that a judicial error had been made and that all the remaining prisoners should be executed, so even more than 15 people were being executed. The Tsar gave them lesser sentences, but gave explicit instructions that only after the entire ritual of preparation for execution should the prisoners be told that their lives had been spared. So this whole thing was really an act to scare the prisoners. The Tsar didn't really want to kill them, he just wanted to pretend that they were about to be killed and then pretend to save their lives uh, in a grand act of imperial grace. So on the morning of December 22nd, the prisoners were taken from their cells without explanation and transported to a big square in St. Petersburg. The sentence of death by firing squad was read out over them, and the first three prisoners, Petrushevsky, Mombeli, and Grigoriev, which were three of the most prominent members, obviously Petrushevsky was the founder, they were seized and tied to stakes in front of the firing squad. A minute had passed, and then a drum roll came, and the soldiers lowered their rifles. Dostoevsky, who had been next to line to Grigoriev, recalled the experience 20 years later. The uncertainty and feeling of aversion for the new thing which was going to overtake him immediately was terrible. Grigoriev, who had been next to Dostoevsky and was showing signs of derangement, completely lost his mind after he found out that he had been spared and spent the remainder of his days as a mental invalid. From there on, the prisoners were placed in shackles and preparations began for their transport to Siberia. After serving four to six years of imprisonment and hard labor, the prisoners' sentences were commuted to exile and service in the army. However, some of the members had already died, but most of them were sent into military service. Some, such as Petrushevsky, died in exile, but both Spreznev and Dostoevsky were allowed to return to Petersburg in late 1859, exactly 10 years after they had been arrested and taken away. So this basically marked the end of the Petrushevsky circle. They had all been arrested, and for 10 years they spent their lives in prison, in Siberia, and eventually were sent to military service. Some of them died in exile, but the circle was a bit overall broken up. So the main goal of the Petrushevsky circle had been to promote more freedom in intellectual life, and for the serfs, just in general, they wanted social change. Now let's talk about the Belyaya circle. They were a group of composers who wanted a style of Russian classical music. They wanted to create more national classical music, specifically, obviously, Russian music. Now they were based off the achievements of the Five. Now the Five was a group of Russian composers that had met from 1856 to 1870. They specifically collaborated so they could make more national classical music. The leader was Balakirov, and the other four members were Cesar Tsui, Musikorsky, Rimsky Korsakov, and Alexander Borodin. One important difference between the composers in the Belyaev circle and their counterparts in the five 
was an acceptance in the necessity of Western-styled academic training. This was an attitude passed down from Mirsky Korsakov, who taught many of the composers in the circle at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. So while the Belyayev circle had a lot of younger and newer composers, Rimsky Korsakov was still like one of the more senior members and he was a lot older and he had actually taught some of the members. It's important to note that Tchaikovsky, one of the most famous composers that we know in Russia, he was totally fine with the Western styles from Germany or France or England. So it's important to note that the members of the Belyayev circle, they had been exposed to the music of Tchaikovsky, so they were open to Western practices and influences, but they also wanted to copy the five in continuing to push Russian national classical music. So the Belyayev circle came to dominate musical life in St. Petersburg. Any composers who desired patronage, publication, or public performance of their works were compelled to write in a music style that was accepted by the members of the Belyayev circle. So let's talk about the members of the circle. Obviously, the most senior of them was Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, who, as I mentioned, was an original member of the Five and really liked national Russian music. Another important member that we know about is Alexander Glazunov, who's famous for a lot of orchestral works. There was also a lot of other members, but they were all concerned with depicting folklore in their music, or maybe they were depicting just basically scenes from Russia, or maybe Russian styles in their tone and sound. But in general, the circle was basically believing in the philosophy of Russian nationalism, promoting Russia's identity in music, and they want to basically bring the Russian revival into the sphere of fine arts. So a fun fact about this group was that it was named after Mitrofan Belyayev, who was a timber merchant, and he was only an amateur musician who became a music philanthropist. He heard the music of the teenage Glazunov and was so inspired that he started paying money and being a patron of music and the arts. All right, so another interesting topic is that many members of the Belyayev circle shared a suspicion of compositions that did not follow the sort of national style that they wanted. They were very distasteful of composers who had slightly Western leanings, and overall they would just disliked anyone who didn't agree with their style of Russian music. This proved true when the first symphony of Sergei Rachmaninoff was published. Now, Rachmaninoff was a student of Tchaikovsky's, so as it is expected, his music has slightly Western leanings and wasn't the sort of national style that the Belyayev circle wanted. Rimsky-Korsakov sounded an advance warning on hearing the symphony when he told Rachmaninoff, forgive me, but I do not find this music at all agreeable. So overall, in general, members of the Five or members of the Belyayev circle had basically criticized a lot of other composers who weren't necessarily following their ideas of Russian national music. So the legacy of the Belyaya Circle extended for quite a long time. The ideas of the Belyaya Circle would continue at the St. Petersburg Conservatory after Rimsky-Korsakov retired in 1906, and his son-in-law was in charge of the composition classes at the conservatory throughout the 1920s. Shostakovich would complain about Rimsky-Korsakov's son-in-law's teaching style at the conservatory, often complaining about how he was too conservative about the music and always tried to push the ideas of Rimsky-Korsakov into his teaching. This traditionalism was not limited only to the St. Petersburg Conservatory, but even in the Soviet era, other conservatories in Russia remained run by traditionalists, um, and they wanted to continue to push this Russian traditional music. Thanks for watching. Betastic is a nonprofit with the mission of using our passions and talents in humanities, arts, and social sciences to inspire everyone to pursue and advance their interests and has. We want to share our knowledge to provide free and high quality classes and programs to make a difference in our community. To learn more about us or our programs, visit our website at btastic.org or find us on social media.